Welcome to Supply Chain Management. In this lecture, we're going to continue with demand forecasting. Now, before we get into all the different methods of demand forecasting, we really need to know how to visualize the data. And then the second part is how to calculate all the different kinds of errors and the confidence interval and what a confidence interval means and what these errors mean. Now, in the last lecture, you've already gone through these terms. Error uh, in time period is forecast minus demand. And we've talked about bias, your absolute error, your tracking signal, your mean squared error, root mean squared error, mean absolute deviation, mean absolute percentage error, right? We have done all of this in the previous uh, lecture. But now we're going to focus on how are we going to calculate this in Excel? And let's move on to Excel. Now, in Excel, I want you to look at the data. Before you start working on Excel, you need to look at the data. So here we have data which has 16 time periods. You have data for 12 time periods. And you notice there are four seasons in each one of this. And this is a three. So one, two, three, four, right? And so we have three years of data. Each year has four different seasons. And here is the demand given to it. So the first thing you do before you start is to plot your data. So you have to look at this here. And here you go. We have plotted our data. And this is called a scatter plot. I would advise you to use the scatter plot, which actually uses these straight line markers, I would advise you against using these curved ones because there is no gap between one and two. So here we go. We get the entire data set as we, um, as we want. Now, with a large set of data, it's easy to see here, and especially if you change the axis here, we format the axis. Um, and we make sure the major unit is one. You can see that the data starts season one, goes up, goes down, then again goes up in season two, right? And so here we have this data set here. But we can actually break this down and look at it in a different way. So let's go back here and I'm going to break this data up by year. So the first year, this is your data, right? Just for the first year. Now for the second year, I go back to select data. I'm going to edit the series and call it year one. And then I'm going to add a second series, year two. And that data is the second data set. And then I'm going to add a third data set, which is your year three. And what this gives you compared to the previous one is a comparison. And of course, you want to uh, make sure your axis is formatted properly. Your, your minimum right now is one. The maximum is four. And your major unit is one here. So here you go. So if we also add the legend for this, you know which year is year one and which is year two and year three, you can clearly see there is a trend. Every year, your demand increases. It goes one on top of the other. The second thing you notice is that your second quarter, your demand increases before decreasing in your third and fourth um, trimesters, sorry, not quarters, trimesters. So now that we have visualized the data, uh, we can actually figure out what forecasting method we can use. So a, t a data like this, which clearly shows some trend, positive trend here, and some seasonality, you would use a method which will accommodate both trend and seasonality. And with the data with just kind of with some random fluctuations, 
you would use a method which just uses level. But let's not worry about the method right now. Let us focus on how to calculate the different errors and how to build a confidence interval. Because this is going to be important irrespective of which method you use. So no matter what method you use, you're going to have to do this every time. And so I'm kind of doing this as a separate lecture for all of you. So let's look at an example where we already have generated a forecast. Uh, don't worry about how I got these numbers because I haven't really taught you any of the forecasting methods. We're, as I said before, we are just going to focus on how to calculate your errors right now. So the, this is your forecast, right? And so the first step is to look at the, the error, right? So your error of E to the ET, or error at time period T, would be your forecast minus your demand. And you can copy this down here. So with this error, you're going to calculate different kinds of uh, values which tell you how good the forecast is. The first one is you're going to look at absolute error. So absolute error is the absolute value of your error, right? So this is the absolute value of your error and you get your absolute error. The second one which we need is squared error. So when we want to calculate mean squared error, you would need the squared error first. And so here we go. We are looking at the squared error of all of this. And I'm just going to go ahead and format this with two decimal places so it doesn't look very bad. All right. The third part is we are going to look at is percentage error or percent error. Right, so percent error, which you need to calculate, is your absolute error divided by your actual demand. Right, and so this is going to be a percentage value. So let us go ahead and format it just so that it appears in percent error. So always, you know, pay attention to formatting because it's going to help you. Uh, when you actually deal with large spreadsheets, you all can often get lost in the numbers. So now that we have calculated these um, different values, we can actually calculate with absolute error, you can calculate MAD or mean absolute deviation. With squared error, you can calculate mean squared error with when you have mean squared error, you can get your root mean squared error. And then with your percent error, you're going to get your mean absolute percentage error. So the first thing we're going to do here is to make sure we calculate these error terms for each time period before we get the final value right here. So the final value is nothing but mean absolute deviation is the average of all this. Mean squared error is the average of all this. And then you take the square root of that. That gives you root mean squared error. And the average of all this would give you mean absolute percentage error. But what we want is a running total for each time period, right up to time period 12. So we can see how our error terms change. So let's go ahead and work this out. So if we want to, we are going to start with MAD or mean absolute deviation. So let's take the average value. And for the time being, we're going to get the average of this F2. And we're going to use click F2 again and close parentheses. And the first F2, you're going to use the function key F4 so that it will change. It will not change when you're copying that value down. Okay. So remember that you are making sure that the two always stays wherever it is, okay? And now you can copy this down and you'll notice that each time period, the error term now expands to 
accommodate the absolute error of that time period. So the first one is just this value. The second one looks at two time periods. And the last one gets the average of all the time periods you have data for. The MSC, you do the same thing with mean squared error. So now you're going to look at the average squared error and you will go ahead and use F4 here and copy this down, which this gives you the final squared error. The root mean squared error is the square root of this value. And we get the value right here. I'm just going to use the same formatting as we go. And your mean average percentage error is absolute percentage error. Mean absolute percentage error is the average of your percent value. And you do the same thing. You follow the same steps for this. And if you copy this down, you will get your absolute value. So here is the running total which you are maintaining. You can also calculate your bias here. So your bias is the sum of all your errors. So now it's not the absolute error, but actually your actual error. So right now the first one is just, and you do the same thing. Here you go F4 for this, and then you copy this down. And that gives you your bias of the total one. So now that you calculated bias, you can calculate your tracking signal. So your tracking signal is nothing but your bias divided by the mean absolute deviation at that point of time. So here we go. We can select that. Um, and again, all of this, we can use the same values. So here's your tracking signal. So your tracking signal is telling you that since it's consistently negative, that you're constantly underestimating your forecast. This might be something for you to look at because what you want your forecast is to the error to be on both sides. Now, it's not a lot, but there is consistent negative values. And that's something you need to be uh, cautious about with your forecast here, okay? So now that we have calculated the tracking signal, we can look at how do we build our confidence intervals. And with the confidence intervals, I'm going to show you how to do a 95% confidence interval, and then I'll show you how to do a 99% confidence interval. Before we do that, let's go ahead and um, format this, get the formatting ready. So let's go ahead and get our outside borders, get it all here, and now go and make sure we have this taken care of, all right? So now we're gonna build a confidence interval and we are going to look at 95%, your upper limit, and then 95% lower limit. So before we look at confidence intervals, let's look at how we're going to build this. The formula for confidence intervals is our forecast plus minus your z-score multiplied by 1.25 times your MAD. And this is going to be your confidence interval. Now your MAD, we are going to use this value we're going to use our final values so we have some consistency so this is your mad this is your root mean squared error and this is your mape so let's look at how we calculate our z score in uh, excel so the first thing is we want our confidence interval is 95 percent so for the upper upper limit we are going to actually do one minus this confidence, right? Which will give us about 5%. And then we want to split this in two equal halves. So let me do a little bit of a screen draw 
to show you what I'm talking about. So if this is a normal distribution, right? We have your confidence interval and this is 95%, right? So this area plus this area outside the 95% is this 5%. And now we can split this into two equal halves. So this is 2.5% and this is 2.5%. All right. So essentially the lower limit is this point here. And so the area corresponding to this lower limit is 2.5%. Similarly, the upper limit is this point here. And so the area corresponding to the upper limit is 2.5% plus 95%, which will give you 97.5%. Okay, I hope you understand how I got 97.5 and 2.5. All right, so now that we've got both those, we use the function norm.s.inv, and we put 0.975 for the upper limit, right 0.975 for the upper limit and then point for the lower limit we use 0 0.025 which is 2.5 percent all right so you can see the values are the same except you have one is positive and one is negative so let's go ahead and use the formula upper limit is your forecast plus norm dot s dot inv 0.975 multiplied by 1.25 multiplied by mean absolute deviation and they're going to put a f4 value and then copy it down all right copy it down completely so here we go we got our 95 percent confidence here upper limit now the lower limit is again your forecast plus norm dot s dot inv but now we're going to use 0 0.025 multiplied by 1.25 multiplied by mad don't forget your f4 here and you can copy this down so now here you have your lower limit so now we can actually plot this whole thing so here is your time period here is your demand, here is your forecast, and here are your upper and lower limit. And I'm using control to do the selection. And I'm gonna select this, and here we go, bingo. We have created a chart which has the forecast. We can see the blue area is your demand. The orange area is your actual forecast and you have your upper and lower, you're 95% confident that your values are going to be between this upper and lower limit. So it's very important when you do a forecast to show the confidence intervals also with the forecast. Um, and with this, we're going to stop here. Remember that all your forecasts should have MAD, MSE, root mean squared error, MAPE, you should show your bias, your tracking signal, and then your confidence interval. It is possible that I ask you for 99% confidence interval, in which case you have to follow the same steps. The upper limit will be 99.5%, the lower limit will be 0.5%. And we'll this, we will stop this lecture right here.